Morning, everybody. How we doing? Uh, the new podcast t-shirts on the site. Check it out. I think it's a pretty cool graphic. Uh, one of my favorite things I've designed, actually. Um, so today we're going to talk about a, several things. I'm not doing Swingville yet. I've um, got a few things coming in the mail, but I'll kind of round that out. And so we're going to wait a week to do that. Uh, in the back, we're playing Al Smith, a great blues singer. And the band here is with Eddie Lockjaw Davis, uh, Shirley Scott, Wendell Marshall, and Arthur Edgel. Fantastic stuff. It's just Blues Baptist Church, you know what I mean? It's fantastic stuff. And that's on the Prestige Bluesville imprint, which uh, is another one of the uh, Prestige sub imprints, of course, more on the blues side of things. But as anyone can tell you, blues and jazz are very interwoven and the fabric's hard to separate at times when you're talking about blues and jazz. Uh, next, I want to talk about Al Gray, uh, the great trombone player. He's just one of the most expressive, dynamic, uh, trick-filled, flirty, cheeky players in any era of jazz. <clears throat> and he's not super well-known to a lot of collectors today which is sad. Uh, I'll show you all his titles, but there's, there he is right there. And he's just a character, and I think you'll get some look into his personality with some of these album covers, like that one right there especially, I feel like, just tells us something about the fellow we're talking about here. And Al Gray, uh, well, someone I've talked about several times before, because he, he's grabbed me by the throat with some of the things he does, some of the sounds that he makes, these guttural, rolling, tricks that will convince the mind that can't be a trombone what is that and it's Al Gray he as much as Jimmy Cleveland will amaze me with its long clear fluid lines on the trombone Al Gray does the same thing with his utterances his exclamations his fanfares his flirty uh, here I am let me make a little bit of noise and stir things up a little bit He's just got a lot of that to him. But we're talking about Al Gray today for one reason, is I was contacted by one of Al Gray's sons, uh, Michael Gray. And uh, he's a trombone player himself, like 61 year retirement. Uh, him and his other three brothers all in the Philadelphia area. And uh, they all were different musicians and different things. A lot of them played the trombone. I believe Michael said he played the valve trombone, which has valves like a trumpet. Uh, that's got to complicate that bone playing somewhat, I think. But uh, what is the added benefit of having valves on a trombone? It's got to change the functionality of it quite a bit from being just this to suddenly being... Uh, anyway, Al's son reached out to me, having seen my channel, because he was re recommended to my channel by something else that I was always kind of excited about, Philadelphia Music. One of the great Discog stores. I buy a lot of stuff from them. They, apparently a few of them watch my channel. And Al Gray, son Michael, works for them in the warehouse and takes out some of the dollar stock, I think 50 cent stock, and sells it in local flea markets. Uh, the guy knew his music though. And he's not super internet technology, technologically savvy. And so he had his friend at Philadelphia Music reach out to me through YouTube. And I didn't know he was Philadelphia Music at first. I got a message saying, Al Gray's son works with my company, he wants to have a, some, to speak with you. It's given, I gave him my email. One thing led to another, me and Al Gray's son talked for 45 minutes the other day. And just the experiences of a black male in America, a lot of it rings very true. And he watched my series on the trombone players from last summer, a year ago, over a year ago, and said I was on point with almost everything I had to say. Which was nice to hear, you know. Uh, he also watched my trumpets. He's, he obviously seems to watch a lot of stuff because he was making comments about some of my recent episodes as well. And uh, definitely seemed to be pretty connected to my material. Which is very flattering that, that somebody connected to that original era that I speak of finds what I have to say inspiring, enlightening, worth listening to. You know, that's, that's enough for me. That's great. But we, we talked about the man, we talked about his life and his brothers as well, the Philadelphia scene, 
uh, the neighborhood they grew up in Germantown uh, all the musicians that were in that area including a young Lee Morgan and Benny Golson it's quite a who's who of players coming up at that time Al Gray of course plays with Basie for quite a while and he's filled with this personality Al has a dark side that's in no, in no small part due to his being raised as a, a black man in America there's a uh, different experience to that upbringing that impacts how they see the world. Uh, the family unit, the family structure is not the same in large part due to the large incarceration of black males. There's a lot of fathers not present to be a parent. Uh, there's a lot that are dead at a young age, don't get to raise their kids. And so there's a lot of different standards, different norms in the black community that don't exist the same in white America. The likelihood of having children with multiple women is a lot greater as well, in part because you often saw your mother having sex with multiple partners because her husband was dead or in jail. And so having the multiple partner thing was a much more commonplace thing in the black American experience. And it wasn't associated with the same degree of shame and guilt and uh, I'm a sinner. I mean, it, 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 they don't really, it's normal in a way. Not to say there's not great black families, because there are, I know many. <clears throat> I know many black traditional, you know, families that are as every bit as the family institution, in some ways stronger. Their religious experience is more genuine, less just a club that they're a part of. Uh, the way they raise their children is very involved. So there's a lot of great black families out there. Don't ever mistake that. But there's a lot of black males that are raised with a different reality. And that impacted Al. He ended up having numerous illegitimate children. Some of them were in Europe, which, because uh, he spent time over there, in part because some of his other behaviors got him blacklisted in America. He was a wild guy to some degree, didn't pay all his debtors, didn't pay his bandmates sometimes. And he got blacklisted, clubs wouldn't book him, he couldn't record. And so he spent some time in Europe where he got into some shenanigans there as well. And so I talked to Al Gray's son, Michael, for, like I said, a good 45 minutes. And it was exciting just to kind of interact and talk about the old, the old times and the experiences and what I'd heard and what he knew and what he remembered and told me. And then, well, that's when we had to go. And I ended up talking to my friend Jean-Michel, who writes for Beethoven. Uh, from Switzerland, who I quote and talk about a lot. And he, of course, booked and promoted a lot of jazz in the 80s and 90s and 2000s in Europe. And he toured with Al Gray, including at one time when he was in Europe, and he shows up in Switzerland and he gets arrested because he had an illegitimate child, illegitimate child with some woman, and she, he wasn't paying child support or responding to those uh, messages even and he got put in jail. Uh, and the experience for a black man in Switzerland in jail is a lot different than it is in America. It's not a family reunion in Switzerland. It's uh, I'm the only black man in town. Uh, he was treated really well from all what I've heard. Uh, one of the concert promoters had deep pockets and paid his bail and got him out. And he ended up making the, the festival and playing. Uh, my friend Jean-Michel spent a lot of time with Al and has a lot of great things to say about him in spite of some of his dark sides, in spite of some of his behaviors. But I don't think that that experience of Al Gray is that unique. I think even from my experience with the hundreds, if not thousands of black friends I have in the Twin Cities, there's a lot of black males that share some of that experience, having children with multiple mothers. It's fairly common to have five kids, three different moms, you know. Uh, like I said, it's not everybody by any means, but there's certainly a lot of it. And there's even a lot of not recognizing uh, child support payments. And that's not something I'm endorsing. But uh, there's all kinds of factors that go into that. From anything from they never really contacted me to I, I'm disputing if it's your child DNA-wise to... Uh, just not having the money to pay it. There's a lot of different factors that can go into that. And if you're in America and you already have a wife with four boys, uh, some email, not well, I wouldn't mean email, but some letter from someplace in Europe or, or England 
saying you have a child with me, I could see, I, I would probably think twice about forking up some of my hard earned money as well, unless I knew for sure, you know. Uh, even then, if there's no money to pay, what are you gonna do? But, so there's a dark side to Al. Some of it seems to be irresponsible, uh, not being able to handle money well. Uh, some of that just comes from life's addictions and behaviors and patterns. But it doesn't take anything away from it. In fact, it adds color. And it helps inform us. Like I said, every, every bit of story we hear about any player, along with those photographs of their face, starts to tell us about who they were as a personality and as a human and how they handle their experience and their environment. And that helps us hear and feel what that guy's playing. And Al's always had a whole lot of talking to that jelly roll in his playing. To me, he was always very flirtatious, very cheeky, very uh, mischief, filled with mischief, <clears throat> filled with uh, just practical jokes here. And Jean-Michel has validated some of that stuff to me. And then talking with his son and just hearing some of these experiences, you can hear some of the trouble he got in is related to how his personality operates and functions. He's kind of loose, shoot, shooting from the hip, and he doesn't always take care of his loose ends, and it ended up costing him. And I think he spent some time in prison in America as well when he got back here at some point. But uh, <clears throat> let's just look at his body of work real quick. Uh, this is Al Gray, dizzy atmosphere. He gets first billing here, uh, along with the great Billy Mitchell, tenor sax, who him and Billy play together quite a lot, do some records together. Then the young 18-year-old Lee Morgan is on this session. Uh, then Charlie Persip's on the drums. Paul West is on the bass. Billy Root is on the baritone sax. And Whitten Kelly's on the piano. This is on the specialty label, which is one of those small little labels that only has a handful of jazz titles. This is an outstanding record. Outstanding. And that's a pretty old pressing. It's not first, maybe a second with the gold logo there. It's just outstanding stuff. It's hard bop, 5758, with a lot of dexterous players. And like I said, 18 year old Lee Morgan is in some ways the star and the fire that stirs this drink. And then Al's got his tricks and Billy's got his blues and Billy Root, and, you know, the whole, the whole band is outstanding. And it's called Dizzy Atmosphere because these guys were pretty much all a part of Dizzy Gillespie's big band at this point. And Dizzy tried to keep his big bands going. And they weren't the big bands in the sense of a Basie or an Ellington. These were more modern big ensembles that were gonna do interpretations of everything from bebop to hard bop to all the, all the edges of the modern sounds that were happening. Dizzy was trying to incorporate all that and somehow make it all accessible and relatable to the older generation. So Dizzy was always that guy trying to make it work, trying to make people understand that the new developments of jazz can have accessibility when presented properly. His body of work gets sadly overlooked a lot, Dizzy's. And partly because it's on a blue note, not on prestige. You know what I mean? It's in different places. And it's, it's a shame Dizzy's kind of been diminished in the modern collector's eye, even though he's one of the greatest players ever. And he can play a ballad as well as he can play the bright fireworks and Dexter's Bebop stuff he does. Dizzy's a great player. If you hear him on Norgrant, some of his early titles there, just, he'll make your hair stand on end. There's some stuff he does with Stan Getz back in the early Norgrant days, 53, 54. It's outstanding. <clears throat> so after Dizzy Atmosphere, uh, he Al Gray goes to Argo. And the last of the big plungers, being 653, was his first record at Argo. Uh, 677, The Thinking Man's Trombone. 689's with him with Billy Mitchell, Sextet. This is an outstanding session. Real blues, modern Chicago blues, jazz. Uh, Art Davis is in the group. Billy Mitchell, Gene Key, Ray Barreto's on the conga. That's some fun stuff. 700 is Al Gray, Snap Your Fingers, featuring Billy Mitchell. And you see him with the plunger there, and his plunger tricks are as good as anybody's in the game. As good as anybody's. Probably the best, really. And he kind of knew that, which I think was part of his 
brash, talking in third person personality, I would guess, you know. This is Al Gray Night Song with Billy Mitchell once again. Great cover, Argo number 711, is it? Yep, 711, the number got smudged a little bit. Al Gray having a ball, 718. So these all run from probably 68, 69, sorry, no, 58, 59, into 61, 62, 63 in that era. They're in that kind of same vein. Uh, Boss Bone, 731, outstanding stuff on Argo. And that's his body of work at Argo, and along with that dizzy atmosphere on specialty. And like I said, like I said he, his life moves forward from this era, and it's a constant discombobulation of impacts and messes and great playing and touring groups and blacklisting and traveling and the life of a jazz man. And so every time I get to chat with people who are related or know directly the stories, it helps enrich and fill out who these players are. And I know Al Gray a little bit better now. So again, thank you, Michael Gray, for reaching out. And we're going to converse more. And I might even try to interview him someday, get him on the channel. Uh, <clears throat> technology is a bit of a challenge for me as well, sadly. And so doing that type of stuff, every time I try to do that, I've not had success doing it. So we'll, we'll get back to that at some point. Again, we have that Al Smith record playing in the background. That is outstanding stuff. Next, I want to talk to you real quick about a couple records that filled in a few gaps I just got. We did a thing on Urania records the other day, and uh, I told you I was missing the Willie the Lion Smith record, and I looked shortly afterwards, and there was one on, I believe it was on eBay, and it wasn't that expensive. Made the guy an offer, and he took it, and the great Willie the Lion Smith is, a lot, is there with Fats Wall and James P. Johnson, those early Harlem Stride boogie piano players, and Willie was a guy that played in the clubs till his death from what I understand. And a record I've been trying to find a long time. Uh, there was an original of this that went to auction about two months ago and I could have won it because it didn't go for very much. But I was too busy having an argument with my oldest stepson at the time. Missed the end of the auction. I was really upset with myself. Uh, I finally just broke down and found one from Japan which completes my story build. I have all of it now. All the 12 inches, all the 10 inches. And this is Boots Mazzilli and uh, Serge Chaloff. And Serge is one of the great baritone players that kind of gets some recognition, but still quite a bit under the radar. A great player who goes to the West Coast. I think he's originally from Boston, but he plays a lot with the Zoot Sims and the Al Cones and that kind of genre of cats. And I'm a big fan of Serge Chaloff. And his first record on Capitol, that first full length is outstanding stuff as well. But Storyville, what a great label. I finally filled that last piece in there. Next, I want to talk to you a little bit about the avant-garde. And I know I don't talk about the avant-garde much, and when I do, I often disparage it. And I don't disparage the music. I disparage the vinyl community that's trying to sell this as the only jazz that matters. That tries to make it sound like Dave Brubeck, oh, that's nonsense. That's silly. Ignore it if it's commercially successful. You know what I mean? The boss know that we can't listen to that. We gotta listen to the most difficult shit all the time. That's what I have an issue with. Because it's this stuff that's peripheral, not Dave Brubeck. And so many of the people in the jazz vinyl community are just always like harping on those records that so many people who are coming into the music get very misled. And that's what I'm trying to adjust. That's what I'm trying to make change. I want people who don't know jazz to embrace it and they're more likely to do that through Time Out, through Jerry Mulligan, through Duke Ellington and John Coltrane. Those are the records that people are going to want to hear and buy and get to know. And then they can come to that stuff later if they want to. And the thing I like about the avant-garde is when you're flustered, when you're on edge, when you're crabby, sometimes that challenging music <clears throat> can fit your mood and actually kind of ease you back into a more comfortable place. When it's right, it's great. And yesterday I played a few things that were really kind of interesting and to the point of being outstanding. And I posted them on my Facebook group on, on Jazz and got quite a bit of feedback there. So I figured we'd talk about it a little bit right now.
My friend Jean-Michel sent me some records from Switzerland. They arrived the other day, and I was playing this afternoon in Europe, Kenny Drew Trio. This is outstanding. It was really beautiful. And that uh, In a Cathedral song, the last song, it's just gorgeous. And uh, The Quiet Cathedral. Uh, Niels uh, Orsted. Niels Henning Orsted. I said Niels Orsted Henning, the bass player. Niels Henning Orsted Peterson, yeah. Knop, as it's abbreviated. He's just dynamic on this. But I was really impressed as well by the great playing of Ed Thigpen on the drums. All three of them lived in Denmark for a long time, having, of, of course, Pedersen was Danish, I believe, European anyway. But Thigpen and Drew both left America and the poor treatment of blacks behind and went to live in Denmark for a long time. I think they both finished their lives out there. I know Drew did. Uh, but Thigpen was really a revelation at points. I'm like, man, he's really playing some great stuff. And then this this song came. I ended up playing uh, Thigpen's one record as a leader from before he went out of the storm. And this is good stuff. And it has some diversity to it. Kind of a Latin number opens the record. Silito Linda, Lindo. Cloud break comes second, but then out of the storm is track number three. It's a seven minute track. And let's talk about the band for a second on this. Kenny Burrell, Clark Terry on trumpet, Herbie Hancock, and Ron Carter. And that's pretty outstanding when you have the melodic playing of a Burrell and uh, Clark Terry's bright, dyna dy dynamic playing, along with young Herbie Hancock and Ron Carter's new way of thinking. There's some avant-garde in this that is something you don't get at Verve very much. Uh, if at all. And what's cool about it is the context of it is out of the storm. And so the dissonance that kind of permeates this, the early parts of this track are the storm clouds, the thunders and the lightnings and the, the dissonance, the weather being chaotic. And we eventually come out of the storm into more melodic phrasing. I want to show you some parts of this though. great stuff by on a great band by a great drummer Ed Thigpen it's kind of a record you could pass over easily it's kind of a, a, a jacket that doesn't really tell you much and you wouldn't even have to necessarily think it's a jazz record when you pass over it aside from the Verve label and Ed Thigpen's not a name you're going to recognize for most people the Burrell Hancock Carter those names are going to have more ring to it than Eddie Thigpen does sadly but uh, there's some real avant-garde moments on this record. The cloud breakup. It's got some real grays, some dark blues, some real elements of dissonance, you know, chaos. And then the other thing I played was out to lunch. I was having kind of a tough day. It's been a tough few weeks, honestly. I've had some issues with my teenager. He actually left home, went to go live with his friend for the last six weeks. He's been over there, and we haven't spoken since. He said some really awful things to me when he left. Uh, it's part of raising children. You know, being a parent is a tough thing. But it's been difficult and it's put some tension between me and my wife. You know, kids can be a real source of stress. And so I played this record after having kind of a long couple days. And it just really was a wonderful uh, harbinger of my own mindset at the time. And this is the opening track, Hat and Beard. And it's a tribute to Monk. But. When you listen to some of these sounds, you could make a parallel 
that this is the Pink Panther theme by the great Henry Mancini done through the lens of Pablo Picasso avant-gardism. It's got some of the same crescendos and bright punctuations, some of the same stride and cool. There's a Pink Panther prowling there. And you can really hear how Mancini was borrowing from the cutting edges of jazz, yet still presenting it in a very accessible, palatable way. And so it's interesting listening to Hat and Beard and thinking of Pink Panther and hearing, like I said, almost this Pablo Picasso type of distillation of that Pink Panther cool. And the time frames are actually quite similar as well. I think this is from 63, which would put it around the same time as the Pink Panther, if I recall. I think this is 63, I'm pretty sure. And the group on here has got Freddie Hubbard. And like Hubbard's again one of those guys that's not really an out player. But in this setting, he can play some pretty dissonant out things. He does it more on his side work than he does on his own work. Uh, Dolphy, of course, plays alto sax, flute, and bass clarinet. Bobby Hutcherson seems to be at the center of a lot of the Blue Note avant-garde at this point. Yet he always brings a melodic sensibility to what he's doing. Uh, I'm always glad when Bobby's there because he'll keep things kind of melodic and centered. Uh, Richard Davis on bass and Tony Williams on the drums. It's a great Blue Note lineup and that second wave of kind of the alt sound going on at Blue Note. And again, if you think of it in the context of being the Black, the Pink Panther done through kind of an avant-garde lens, you'll hear some real similarities. And there's all the tracks in this record are quite wonderful and have a lot of interesting revelation to them. Dolphin's a pretty brilliant guy. And it's always been kind of sad we didn't get more Dolphy. So much of his body of work is live stuff that doesn't really show you the showcase of what an album can. You know what I mean? The distillation of sound and really refining something to make it how you want it to be. Live, you'll get a spontaneous thing, which you can still be impressed by that, of course. But with the avant-garde, I think the recordings of the albums help us understand what these sounds are supposed to be. But again, a lot of this has a noir element to it, uh, a bit of chaos, a bit of cacophony, and the uncertainty of this moment in the film. You know what I mean? Murder is thy name. It's 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 got a danger to it, uh, and that's this music. When you go to it, when you say I'm in the mood for some edge, and you put it on, it's so wonderful. It's just a matter of putting it in its proper place. Let's not try to impress upon everyone that this is the only way jazz should be heard. This is a wonderful thing when you're in the mood for some spice, or some bitter, or some dry. You know what I mean? Sometimes you want a really dry wine. Sometimes you want a really bitter beer. Sometimes you want a really spicy meal. Sometimes you want your ear to be fixated on something a little bit more dissonant. You might match or even help relieve some of your own tension. And I, I did get quite a bit of joy from this the other day. It was a positive experience for me. And it's a record I've had for 20 years. I've listened to it plenty. You know, and again, back in the early 2000s, late 90s, I listened to a lot of avant-garde, a lot of new thing. That's kind of where my jazz energy was focused. And as I've gotten older, I've kind of migrated away from that to the stuff that was the bigger part of the music. And sometimes I take some heat from the avant-garde people. And it's not like I don't enjoy it. There's Freddie. It's not like I don't enjoy the avant-garde. I love it, especially in its right setting, when I'm in the mood for it, when you go to it. And that's, going to it part is the key. That's what so many of us don't seem to understand, is when we put a record on, we're going to that art saying, I want this right now. And it doesn't mean that everybody in the room is going to want that same thing. And I think we need to make that clear to people so that people will come to jazz. And those who want to go to this, fantastic. It's awesome. It's great. 
And in every film I want, I want a few elements of danger and tension. You need that. But I'm hoping my tension gets resolved. Because sometimes it can be frustrating getting to the end of David Lynch's Lost Highway and going... Mulholland Drive, to me, had more sense to it. I, I kind of got how he was talking about Hollywood. And I've watched them both multiple times. And Hollywood's the monster that's chasing him down the hallway, making the, the, the waitress, the failed actress waitress, blow her brains out. Because the dream, the allure of Hollywood becomes her death siren song. The pressure, the expectation. It's, it's ruining lives more than it's making stars. And so I think the film is about Hollywood, Mulholland Drive. Lost Highway by David Lynch is a bit more of a mind. It seems like it's a personality change that happens multiple. It's, but it's not clear. And Lynch likes to leave things that way all of the time. That's part of his modus operandi, as he once said in Twin Peaks. So just a fun rundown of some things I've been listening to. I hope you all enjoyed that Moodsville episode. Don't pass those up when you see them. They're good stuff. And then the Swingville episode will be coming probably next week when I get a couple of records I just ordered. Uh, I wanted to finish a few numbers out. Uh, there's a few things at the end I still don't have, but we'll talk about that in that episode. So you all be safe. You all stay good out there. Uh, thanks again to my friend uh, David Yoshida, who sent me a care package of Canadian treats. I'll follow this episode up with what he sent to me. I'll op- I'll op- I opened the box last night and filmed it. I'm going to share it with y'all. Some fun little Canadian treats that bring back memories and please my taste buds. So, again, thank you, David, for that. Hope y'all enjoy watching that opening. Uh, Check out the merch store. Help support the channel. Um, Everyone, y'all be safe. I'm going to Canadian Thanksgiving today with my brothers and my mom. So we'll have a good evening. And then I got a DJ all weekend. So I won't be around much the next couple days. I'll try to comment when I have some time and respond to people. But uh, we'll talk to you all soon. And be blessed. Peace. Hello, guys. Jazz Shepard here. Uh, my favorite, David Yoshida, who's a longtime viewer of the channel, friend of mine. He donated $100 to me through uh, PayPal a few weeks back. Thank you very much. And we got to chatting, even though I was a Canadian, and he decided to send me a Canadian care package. Uh, so we're going to unbox it, which is a YouTube thing, I guess, here on the channel today as a little fun aside. I'm wearing a Jerome Ginla no, Calgary see it. Flame jersey, which uh, is a shout out to the town of Lethbridge from where David said he was originally from, even though now I believe he's in the Edmonton area. So we're gonna. I told him today, I knew Canadian Thanksgiving came early, but I didn't know Canadian Christmas did as well. So let's see what's in the care package. I know I asked for a coffee, Chris. Big fan of those. And I'm guessing there's gonna be some stuff I forgot about because I've been here for 30 years. So I'm kind of excited. And with the pandemic, of course, I haven't been back to Canada at all. And so here we are on the inside. Number one, Doritos, ketchup Doritos. I didn't know that was even a thing. Thanks for the great videos. They are Gretzky appreciated. (laughs) Enjoy some taste of home. Go Canada. Ketchup Doritos, again, did not know that was even a thing. That's pretty awesome. Mr. Big Bar. I definitely remember the Mr. Big Bar. What's in it? I think it's got nougat and marshmallow, if I remember. Cadbury is a great Canadian candy company. Crunchy Bar, which is kind of like... <clears throat> Look at that, what's it remind you of? Butterfinger. Yeah, Butterfinger, yep. Another Mr. Big Bar. Here we got Hickory Snicks. <laughs> I do remember these as well from Hostess. That was fun hockey practice stuff. They're like little fried onions or fried no, potatoes? Little, just little, almost like mashed potato sticks, I think. Nice. Old Dutch dill pickle. Cornichon 
lime pack. That's awesome. Thank you, David. And then, of course, I need Munchy Coffee Crisp. He got me two packs of Coffee Crisp. And what is a Coffee Crisp, pray a tell? Coffee Crisp was a wonderful, light, well aerated center with hints of coffee, chocolate, biscuit, Twix without so much cookie crunch. Delicious. And with the coffee flavor? More of this. Oddly enough, I'm celebrating Canadian Thanksgiving with my family tomorrow. I got three brothers in the area. Oh, the Caramel Bar. What would you do for a caramel bar was the famous commercials when I was a kid. And the devil would always respond by saying, anything. Anything? Wonderful little, basically caramellos like they are in America with the caramel inside the chocolate. Except not little. And make your teeth hurt. Arrow Bar was a wonderful, really aerated, bubbly chocolate bar. These remind me of my childhood, no question about it. Old Dutch ketchup chips. Legend. David Yoshida, you're warm on my heart. Love it. My brothers might enjoy some of that tomorrow. And then this is Northern Boreal Elevate Coffee Roasters, medium roast. Nice. Sounds like it's beans, we'll have to grind it. And it smells delicious, actually. And this is already ground, this one looks like. And this is from Kicking Horse Coffee, Lucky Jim. The cat didn't come with the box. Hi, Daisy. She's already a resident of the home. We like coffee a lot. We love coffee. Yes. And then, oh my goodness, this looks like it could be Canadian maple syrup. Nuh-uh. We'll see. I thought it was a pair of socks initially. That's going in the coffee. <laughs> and the cat's going in the box. The cats do like a good box. No, Saskatoon syrup, Summerland sweet. So it looks like it's a berry, Saskatoon berry, perhaps. Okay, that's going in the tea. <laughs> and then last but not least, for my friend David Yoshida. <laughs> Pure maple syrup. Yay, coffee! You can't put maple syrup in coffee. And Henry. And it's a festive holiday. It's so, like rose lawn. David Yoshina, thank you greatly for this wonderful box of good treats. Put it on the floor for the cat. Very nostalgic. Uh, certainly a trip down memory lane. Some things I've not seen in a long time. And thankfully, I will share some of this with my family tomorrow to avoid any diabetic seizures of my own. Uh, thank you again, David. And I hope people in the channel enjoy that as well. Uh, Anybody I ever wants to send a thank you or an appreciation outside of Patreon, you can always go to my uh, PayPal and send a little donation there if you want. It's always appreciated. Again, thank you, David, for that. Wonderful gift. It was great chatting with you, and of course, we'll continue to chat. On to the next part of my video. Thanks.